So not all doubts are the same. Some doubts arise out of woundedness, something your father did to you or a standard your father held you to and now you can't believe that your heavenly father could love you unconditionally because you know your father. Some doubts rise out of ignorance. You spent your whole life learning to see the world through modern scientific fact based eyes and now you show up to church and every Sunday there's some pastor praying that God would give you eyes to see and ears to hear God's work in your life and you don't even know what that means. And some doubts arise from what Isaiah the Apostle Paul and Jesus refer to as willful ignorance. You don't believe because you don't want to believe. So when I was um, 14, 15 years old, something like that, I went off to a conference and um, I was struggling. I know this is going to be hard to believe, but I was struggling at the time with lust. I know, surprising. It caused this deep inner conflict in me and what made it like a hundred and a thousand times worse is I had just read this Christian book that told me, oh, don't worry about it. Boys will be boys, you know, it's just, it's good, it's natural, it's fine, don't get out of bed out of shape. And yet, at the same time, I felt really deeply convicted at the same time, and I didn't know what to believe. So I tested God. Like I said, I was at this conference, and I was all alone in my room, and I'm somewhere on this big co college campus. Our youth group had gone there for some event, and I'm all by myself in this room, and I prayed, God... I feel so convicted right now, but I don't know what to believe. I don't know what's true. God, if lust is a sin, please tell me. Give me a sign. Send someone right now to knock on my door. And then I waited. And I sat there. And I started to relax, and then I heard bang! I was terrified some huge bang on my door and I ran to the door, I threw it open, but nobody. Nobody was there, nobody was in the hallway, nobody. God clearly answered my prayer and I have never struggled with lust since that day. <laughs> That's how the story's supposed to finish. But the real story is that I did hear a bang on the door. I did go out in the hallway, see that no one was there. And then doubts began to creep in. Was that really God? Would God really bang on my door? Was it, didn't something just happen? Uh, it was my mind playing tricks on me. That couldn't be God. God couldn't do that. Here's the sickness of my little 14, 15 year old heart. I made the conditions, not God. And then God, in his grace, met my conditions, banged on the door just for me, allowed me to test him. I had no logical reason to doubt my own experience of God directly, immediately answering my prayer. I had proof, but I didn't want to believe. Maybe it's just me, but in my experience, more proof doesn't necessarily mean more faith. So an old friend of mine, Patrick, is what you would call an agnostic, but he's like a committed agnostic. Like, ooh. Like, by that I mean he's committed to the idea that you can't know God. You just can't. And so we would have all these long conversations, and I remember going to him and saying, Patrick, what would it take for you to believe in God? And he said, God himself would have to show up in person and say, here I am, believe in me. And I was like, have you ever heard of Jesus? More proof doesn't necessarily mean more faith. In fact, even when God himself shows up and says, here I am, by and large, the world does not respond with faith, but responds with doubt. According to the scriptures, to our world, to our history, to our lives, to our relationships, to our deepest desires, they are littered with evidences, proof of God. The very stars in the sky, the sun rising up, the wind, everything speaks to our creator, God, which suggests 
proof is not the problem. We are. So the question for today, so what about you? Are you open to the proof of God's presence, of his love, of his calling and commanding your life? Are you open to the way God is revealing himself to you today in your life? That's the question woven in, into every page of our text today. We are in Judges chapter 6, chapter 7, the story of Gideon. If you want to follow along, Judges 6 and 7. Gideon is the doubting Thomas of the Old Testament. He's the patron saint of those who are haunted by doubt, doubts, who, those, um, who know what the Word of God says, but don't want to believe it, who need proof and proof and more proof before they can finally work their way through it. If GVF were more of a traditional place, I would say we should all get like his, his, um, his little saint charm and we should start each service by lighting a candle with his face on it because this is such an issue. Gideon's issues are our issues at GVF and in our world today. It's a story that we need to hear. It's the story that not only sits at the center of the book of Judges, it sits at the center of our lives. And, and just to make the point, the book of Judges, if you remember from the first week, is X-shaped. And right at the heart of it is Gideon's story in two halves. And today we're going to take the first half of that. His story marks the turning point in the book. In this text, the first half of his story, it forces us to probe his doubt. And it forces us to probe our own doubts. Let's get to it. Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. This is the cycle of sin again. Only this time, um, what's happening is it's not the usual king who wants to take over the world type situation. This time, there's the Midianites and this whole group of people, the eastern peoples, who when the Israelites, when they raise their crops, their agricultural agrarian society, agricultural people. So that's their entire economy. When they raise their crops, the Midianites and these eastern peoples then swoop in. They terrorize the Israelites, force them to run off and hide in caves, and then they steal all the crops, ravage the land. This is worse than anything they've seen yet in the book of Judges. The key phrase is in verse 5 here. It says this, They, these eastern people, came up with their livestock and their tents like a swarm of locusts. That's the key phrase. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. That phrase, swarm of locusts, is a familiar phrase. If you know your Old Testament, that phrase is pulled straight out of Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's the phrase that should make the ancient Israelites shudder. This is the ex exactly what Moses told them would happen if they abandoned God. A swarm of locusts would ravage their land. Anyone who knew the Bible would have known that this is the promised curse. The curses of God are coming upon us we are cursed by God because we've abandoned God. But the problem is, Judges chapter 6, nobody knew their Bible. So God has to send a prophet to tell them what's wrong with them. And today we got a lot of text, so I'm going to have to summarize a bunch. But what we see in the very next scene, verses 7 through 10, is a prophet shows up and he tells them, Hey, this is what's going on right now. The promised curse of God is happening. And he lays it out. He proceeds to lay out the what God has done for them, all the proof of what God has done for them, how he saved them out of Egypt, how he, how he defeated Pharaoh, how he led them through the Red Sea. He's pointing back to all the miraculous things that God has done along the way, that God has been with them in his presence, that he's proven himself time and again. From manna, pillar of fire, walls of Jericho falling down. That's what he's referring back to, that God has done these things and he's done what he promised that they've heard the very promises of God in an audible voice. But here's the punchline. God has spoken to you, but you have not listened to me, says God. God spoke, but they didn't listen. They chose not to listen. So why are the Israelites so plagued by doubt? Because they don't want to believe. It's not from a lack of proof. And with that set up, enter Gideon. Verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak at Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite. 
where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The angel of the Lord appears and calls Gideon a mighty warrior. Like this sounds fantastic. It's a really good start to a judge's story, except there's something wrong with the scene here. Threshing wheat. How many of you know what threshing wheat is? All right, so a few of you, so it's like you got to take the wheat, you got to beat the tar out of it to get the, the, the seed, the grain to separate from the chaff, this messy stuff. And so where you would usually do that is a place where it was a nice windy location, usually the top of a hill or a threshing floor, which would be at a windy place. Why? Because you want the, the wind to blow away the chaff. But he is doing it in this, in something like this. This is an ancient wine press which is sunk down into the ground now if you do it if you thresh wheat in an ancient wine press i'm just imagining right now this cloud of like hay shaft like sticking to your face i get hives just thinking about it i need to take a claritin but gideon is doing this this is a terrible terrible place to thresh wheat but it's a good place to hide and that's exactly what Gideon is doing. So there's this immediate irony that he calls him a mighty warrior, but our mighty warrior is hiding in a wine press. And with that said, listen to Gideon's response to the angel. Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Now, this is one of those, um, those lines that in English sounds fine, um, but it's helpful. There's a, a scholar, a Daniel Block, Hebrew scholar, who, uh, who says, and I quote, that Gideon's response is cheeky and sarcastic. So we need to read cheeky and sarcastic, whatever cheeky means. I believe it's British. <laughs> the point being, this is not a sincere question. He's like, well, excuse me. You just called me a mighty warrior. Well, if, if, uh, if God is with us, why am I hiding in a wine press right now? Gideon continues, cheeky and sarcastic. Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. So when the angel suggests that the Lord is with him, God's presence is with him, Gideon, like many of us, immediately becomes skeptical. He immediately doubts God's word. If God is with me, then why is my life so hard right now? If God is with me, then why am I going through this? God's abandoned us. He's not showing up to people anymore. Cheeky and sarcastic, that's the sense. And of course, what makes this whole dialogue right here all the more awkward is that at that very moment, Gideon is speaking to God himself. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? So whoever the angel of the Lord is in this text, he is so closely associated with God himself that the text can just refer to him as the Lord. He can speak the Lord's word. Some see this as a theophany, a visible appearance of God himself showing up at that time whatever that means, a visible manifestation or appearance of Yahweh. Some just see him as a representative of Yahweh. But however you see it, this is the figure, the, the physical symbol of God's presence is with him. He's speaking to God right now for God. But Gideon, bless him, he still doesn't get it. And so he goes on to argue with God. Have you ever argued with God? Gideon tells God all the reasons why he, he's wrong. God, you can't possibly be right because I'm the weakest. I'm the smallest. I can't possibly save anyone. You've got your facts all wrong, God. And the Lord answers him, verse 16. 
I will be with you. And that, that changes how we read the text. Because this, suddenly, we've heard this before. We've heard this before. This becomes the very conversation that God, Yahweh, had with Moses at the burning bush. God shows up to... Or, God shows up to Moses at the burning bush and when he says, I am who I am, and then he says, go, I'm sending you to set my people free. Moses says, who am I? I can't. He says, I will be with you. Direct quote from Exodus chapter 3. So if you're an ancient Israelite reading this text, you must be thinking, holy moly, Gideon is the new Moses. That's, he's the one we're waiting for. He's the promised Messiah. Deuteronomy chapter 18 promises that a prophet like unto Moses will come. And when he comes, when Moses comes back, he will save his people. Gideon's the new Moses. He's our savior. And like Moses who needed a staff that could turn into a snake and such, Gideon wants some proof. It's totally understandable. He wants a sign that the Lord is really with him. So Gideon says, okay, okay. So we're having this, I'm the new Moses, we're having this conversation, wait right here, and he runs off, and he kills a young goat, boils it, cooks it up in some stew, bakes an enormous amount, like 20 pounds of bread. I don't know what he's going to do with all that, but a huge amount of bread, and then he brings it all back, and he sets it up on this rock, and then he pours out the stuff on top of the rock, and then the angel, we read in verse 21, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand, and fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. <laughs> to which Gideon replies, or responds, by wetting his pants and screaming like a little girl. It's in my text. But that seems to be his response. He's terrified. I'm pretty sure, I just saw the angel of the Lord. I'm pretty sure I'm going to die here. So God comforts him, you're not going to die. But then he says, hey, now that I have your attention here, I've got your first mission for you. I want you to go home to your dad's place. And you know that uh, altar to Baal and that Asherah pole, those, that idolatrous shrine on your dad's property? I want you to tear it down. I want you to cut down the Asherah pole. I want you to slaughter his prime bull from his, from his herd. And I want you to offer a sacrifice to me using the wood of the Asherah pole on that site. I want you to tear it all down and make a sacrifice to me. Now, we, to which we say, your dad is an idolater? Wait, this is the same dad who told you about what God had done in saving his people out of Egypt. He has an altar to Baal and Asherah on his property. That his dad worships God and the God of money. Worships God and the goddess of personal happiness. These gods are literally enshrined in his life. So God says to Gideon, before you can serve me, you have to tear down the altars at home. Let me repeat that. Before you can serve me, you have to tear down the altars at home. Verse 27. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar, demolished, and Asherah pulled beside it, cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on a newly built altar. And they asked each other, who did this? And they grabbed their pitchforks, they're ready to kill whoever did this, and they run to it, they figure out that it's Gideon, and so they run to his dad's house, and his dad steps in and says, hey, I thought Baal was the god of, like, thunder and lightning, the god of war. Do you really have to fight his battles for him? Let Baal come after my son, if that's the issue. So they renamed Gideon to Jeroboam, which is let Baal contend with him, or let Baal kill him, literally. Now, at this point, we're thinking, okay, this Gideon, he sure seems to be scared a lot, but, but 
he's the new Moses, right? So it's just, if we just wait just a minute, he's going to go off and he's going to be fearless, just like Moses standing before Pharaoh. That's who Gideon is. But then we read down when the story breaks out in verse 33. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people forced, joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summonsing the Abiezrites to follow him. So this is the part, let's pause right there. So, so he, he, the Spirit of the Lord comes on him, he blows the trumpet, g- gathers the whole army, and this is the part of the story right here. This is the part where he's going to become a mighty warrior, right? This is the part where Danny LaRusso, the wimpy kid who gets beat up, becomes Daniel's son. This is the part where William Wallace comes down and, and like all the Highlanders come down and they're going to take on DeLongshanks. The kid who was hiding in the wa- wine press at the beginning of this when we first met him, he's going to become a mighty warrior. That's what's supposed to happen. But instead we read in verse 36, Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you've promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there's dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. Instead of going to battle, Gideon lays out a fleece. Probably looks something like that. Haven't changed much over the thousands of years. So in church, when I grew up, laying out a fleece was a thing. How many, do you guys, did you guys talk about laying out a fleece, you know? I don't know? Laying out a fleece was like, this is how you know what God's will for your life is. You lay out a fleece, right? This is, this is the language that we used growing up. And there was one woman at my church um, who, who she, I, I still remember like when I was in high school, she sat down and told us, this is how I determine God's will for my life. I lay out a fleece. And one of her examples was she would have this long commute to work every day. And she said, if every light I hit on the way there, God, is green, I'm taking that as a sign that I need to change careers. So she hopped in her car that morning. She drove, but the first light she got to was red. And she said, the Lord's will be done. I'm not supposed to change careers. I'm supposed to be here forever. Now, I deeply appreciate the sincerity of such faith, so please hear that. And I I encourage you to look for God's hand at work in your life in every circumstance. And surrendering our will to God is so very right. The only problem with what she did is that this text has nothing to do with finding God's will for your life. Nothing. Zero. Zero. Gideon already knows God's will. God, I know what you told me to do. He already knows what God wants him to do. God's quite clear. You're to go. You're to fight the Midianites. I'm going to save my people through you. There's no question. There's no ambiguity here. Gideon knows exactly what God's will for his life is. So if he already knows what God's will is, why is he laying out a fleece? Because God's word is not enough for him. He wants more proof. And to our great surprise, God gives him that proof. Verse 38, and that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next morning when he squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Laying out your fleece is not a way to seek God's will. It's refusing to take God at his word and demanding more proof. It's knowing what God says, but refusing to trust him with it. And now that Gideon has more proof, we're thinking, okay, finally, we can get on with this. You've got your proof. But no, he's like, let's do this again, God, just one more time. But I want you to switch it up. Then I really, really, really know that this wasn't just accidental, that you were the one who did it. And he wakes up the next morning and God does it. The whole ground's wet. The fleece is dry. Now this story, it does not tell us how to find God's will for our life. Rather, it shows, number one, Gideon is not who we thought he is. He is not the new Moses. He's the new Israel. He's not living out Exodus chapter 3 where Moses uh, is called into action. He's living out Exodus chapter 17 where the Israelites are led by God and they complain and they test him and they test him they test him then no matter what God does for them they don't want to trust him or follow him he is the new Israel not the new Moses 
That's the first thing we learn. The second thing we learn is what God's like. He is so patient, so obscenely, unusually, outrageously patient with our unbelief. Thanks be to God. So now that Gideon has all this proof, the, the, the angel of the Lord setting aflame the, the altar and then the fleece and then the other fleece. Now that he has all this proof, more proof than anyone has, should ever have to ask for, he's ready to go take on the Midianites. So he gathers together this huge army. He now has 32,000 fighting men and he's at the, Her- at the spring of Herod, which means spring of trembling. And we read in chapter 7, starting in verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Do you see this? God says, no, no, we have got a problem here. You see, there's a subtle temptation to think that if you're strong, that you don't need God. There's a subtle temptation to think we can save ourselves, to think that what we really need in life is a better plan, is more money, more friends, more insurance, a better spouse, a better job, to try harder. There's a subtle temptation to say, okay, God, I trust you, but then turn and depend upon your own strength, your own ingenuity. And God won't have it. So he tells Gideon, okay, here at the the, uh, spring of trembling, if anybody's trembling with fear, send them home. 22,000 take off. And then God says, ah, we're closer, but we're not there. She says, have everyone take a drink. And they all take a drink. And those who lap the water like a dog, (laughs) he says, send them home. And there's Gideon left with 300 men, an army of 300 against tens of thousands. To which Gideon says, this is impossible. And God says, exactly. Now we're ready. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. The word of the Lord, go, I'm giving it into your hands. I've proven myself to you again and again and again. You have no reason to doubt But God knows Gideon's heart. He knows how hard it is for Gideon to trust. How hard it is for Gideon to believe something that he didn't think up. Something that he can't control. So God adds in verse 10. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. And listen to what they're saying. Afterwards, you'll be encouraged to attack the camp. So they sneak down to the camp at night, him and his servant, and they go up to one of the, the, the tents and they, they put their ear against that and they listen in on these two Midianites talking and the one guy is, is sharing a story about a dream he just had. It's like, I had the craziest dream. I was dreaming and I saw this giant barley loaf rolling down the hill, rolling down the hill, and it went down the hill and it smashed into the tent and it knocked the tent over and just destroyed things. Now, do you know the theological significance of a rolling barley loaf? Me neither. It appears to be a meaningless dream, except that the other Midianite hears this and he's like, oh, a barley loaf? Oh no, that could be none other than Gideon coming in and destroying all of us. Why he says that, we have no idea. But Gideon hears this and says, it's true. I am a giant barley loaf. Praise be to God. And he worships God when he hears this. Listen to this. When Gideon heard the dream, I'm a barley loaf. And its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. I'm a barley loaf. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Now this, I'm laughing, making fun just a little bit, but isn't this interesting? I want you to pay attention to this detail here. 
Gideon won't believe God's word when he says it directly to him. He won't believe God when he shows up. He won't believe the wet fleece and he won't believe the dry fleece. But when he hears the barley loaf theory of some Midianite, he's just convinced, ready to go. Gideon seems to have more faith in the opinion of a random Midianite than in the very word of God. How is it possible that God's people could have so little faith in the word of God? How is it possible that God's people could have, be more responsive to the opinion of a random news commentator or an actor or an economist or a scientist or a blogger or a social media influencer than the very word of God? This is shocking. This is dumb. And yet, God is patient with us. God is patient with Gideon. And now what comes is what we've been waiting for, the epic battle scene. Gideon divides up the 300 soldiers, arms them with these lanterns and these trumpets, and secretly sends them out to the surrounding hillside there. And then um, and they have their lanterns covered in this jar. And then he gives them the instructions, verse 17. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When we get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. And when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from around the camp blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Now this last little phrase here and for Gideon kind of gets stuck in the throat like how could someone have so much proof that it's not by his strength not in his name not because of his courage and certainly not because of his faith and yet already start taking credit for the victory odd isn't it but that's next next week So meanwhile, whatever Gideon's motives might have been, the execution is perfect. We read this in verse 20. The three companies blew their trumpets, smashed the jars, so suddenly all the Midianites can see the the torches, grasping the torches in their left hand and holding in their right hands the trumpets. They were blown and they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord calls the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords And in their confusion, they start killing one another. And those who survive the initial chaos, they flee off. And the 300 soldiers chase after them and hunt them down. And then he calls on the men of Ephraim to stop them at the Jordan. And then they they start annihilating the the enemy. And then they capture these two evil guys, Oreb and Zib, whose names mean the, the generals of the Midianites named Raven and Wolf. Cool names. And they chop their heads off. And with that, Gideon the coward, hiding in his daddy's wine press. Gideon the doubter, who needs proof upon proof upon proof, becomes Gideon the mighty warrior. In order to make Gideon the person God was calling him to be, the mighty warrior, God had to first expose his fear and his unbelief. He had to take away any sense that another God may save him, not Baal, not Asherah, or any sense that this might just be random. It's not just happened to be wet, happened to be dry. Or any sense that he could do this in his own strength, take away all the army. Then and only then was Gideon ready to believe. Then and only then could Gideon become who God was calling him to be, his mighty warrior. That's what it took for Gideon. The question, what about you? Real faith requires deep heart work. It requires exposing our fears, exposing our control issues, exposing our wounds. It takes time. It means letting go. It means letting God expose all these things, all the reasons why you don't want to believe. And for some of us, it feels like a journey that is one step forward, two steps back. What about you? What fears, desires, gods, excuses, control issues will God have to strip away from you before you're willing to finally trust him? So the greatest proof, the greatest proof that God could possibly give us is that he himself would enter into our world, would show us his very life, 
would die and then come back from the dead. Jesus is the ultimate proof of God's presence, of God's love, of God's character, of his calling, of his command in our lives. Jesus is the ultimate proof that God is calling you to more. More than your small life, more than your small career, more than your small house, more than your smallness. He is calling you to be a child of God, an ambassador of Christ, a citizen of the very kingdom of God, one who lives forever. Jesus is the ultimate proof that God is with us. He is the ultimate proof that we don't have to win the battle on our own because he already won it on the cross. We only need to trust him. That is both the good news and the hard part. We can't win the battle on our own. We have to trust him. So I want to close today with an invitation. Two weeks ago, I, um, I introduced you, you might not know this, but I introduced you the first of Martin Luther's 95 Theses, and it was that the entire life of believers is to be one of repentance. So we talked about your whole life is supposed to be one of sitting before God saying, God, I need you to save me and living in gratitude to that. So I encourage this daily practice as we go through this period of Lent. This week, I want to help dial that in a bit using Gideon's story to guide your confession, your repentance. Three things I want to point out about what it looks like using Gideon's story to guide our repentance. The first is this. I want to encourage you to ask God to show you the areas of your life where you don't want to believe. Areas where you know what God says but you don't want to. Areas where you, you know what God says, you know what he wants you to do, but it's so hard for you to trust. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's control. I don't know what it is for you. We all have these areas. But I would encourage you to start there. Ask God, God, where are these areas in my life? And then don't leave it there. For those who want to go even deeper, ask God why. Why don't I want to trust you with my money? Because I promise you, it's not about money. Money is the presenting issue. What is it? What security are you looking for? What hope? What, does it make you feel important? Does it make you feel successful? Does it make you feel worthy? Does it make you feel safe? What is it that you're looking for in money that you should be looking for in God? What are the deeper issues? Where do those come from? What thing in your past? What thing in your personality? What is it? What relationship? What is it exactly that is raising that in you? And it might not be money. It could be whatever. Whatever's in your life. Don't just ask, what is it? But why, Lord? Why is this in my heart? And then third, ask God for the grace to surrender those deeper heart issues to him. Ask God for the grace to surrender those deeper heart issues, those things that feed your unbelief that make you not want to trust God. Ask God for the grace to surrender those things to you, not just money, but the issue underneath your money. Not just lust, but the issue underneath your lust. Not just anger, not just control, but the issue underneath it. What is it deep at your heart that's broken that you know the gospel has to fill, Jesus has to fill, but you use these other things to fill? that cause doubts to cloud your life. And here's the prayer that I want to leave you with. It's one that has often been my prayer. It's from Mark chapter 9, verse 24. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Let's pray. Father, we live in a time, in a day where belief is mocked, where proof, especially scientific proof, is exalted beyond reason. <laughs> and God, we know that you are beyond reason. You are not irrational, but super rational, beyond what we can prove. You do not exist in space and time. And yet, God, we so want to control things. We so want to be able to only believe what we can control, what we know for sure. 
God, I, I pray that you would help us as we sort through even this week these deeper issues in our hearts as we seek to be a church that is aligned with your spirit that surrenders deeply to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. We do believe. Help us in our unbelief. Amen.